But Du Bois is going through development himself. Mm -hmm. Then in the 1920s, a lot of people thought A. Philip Randolph was more advanced than Du Bois mm -hmm. because Du Bois was a social democrat. His notion was socialism of the past, of the path, I should say. And that was his position. I don't know when he trained over to the Marxist position. Mm. And theoretically, he made some real errors when he, like his chapter on the dictatorship of the black proletariat. Mm -hmm. The blacks were not a proletariat, but, uh, mm. uh, uh, you know, they were a peasant. So all working people are not proletariat. Proletariat is a technical term right. for uh, workers who are divorced from the means of production and are forced to sell their labor, labor power. And this is this yeah. is in his Black Reconstruction. Yeah, yeah. He he modified that. Mm -hmm. He changed in subsequent footnotes. Uh, he said he he admitted he made a uh, mistake with that with that statement in the first edition of. The, he didn't change the Black Pro the Black Reconstruction, but he qualified that. But Du Bois, but Garvey's movement, first place, it started in the 1890s, and I find it disturbing in Pan-African movements when the blacks, going back to Paul Cuffey and other, their Pan-African movement was a Pan-Negro movement. And the con even Stokely had that, and the concept of a black nation. Now when the African nationalists came along in the latter part, the first person they ran into difficulty with was Edward Wilmot Blyton. Mm -hmm. I, there was two articles in Journal of Modern Africa, because they did not, and do not today, support all African nations. They did not support Kwame Turi. There was an article in uh, Journal of Modern African Studies comparing the Pan-Africanism of Du Bois of uh, in Kuma with the Pan Africanism of Nyeri, which is different. I don't want to get off on that tangent though. Now the point is, Du Bois came up through the movement. First, he was with the Afro American League. He was a youngster then, because in the 1880s, he was born in 1868. Hell, he must have been less than 20 years old. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then uh, his youth has not been dealt with. Then he got enamored with the education with Bishop Crumel, mm -hmm. who developed the concept of, of the civilizing elite. Mm -hmm. And Crumel's worth studying, too. The, what was it, uh, the American Negro Academy? That's right. Mm -hmm. So in that, he, had, he began to have more attention to the cultural aspect of ethnicity, the cultural... I don't think he was quite a cultural nationalist, but you had to deal with, at that time, social science weren't that well developed mm -hmm. in terms of disciplines and so forth. So these are geniuses type people who are anticipating things, same with his world in Africa. He anticipated a lot of things that was, that was not verified exactly, mm -hmm. but his general thesis was, was correct. So Du Bois came through the pan African movement, the first one, but where he did the color line thing, mm -hmm. problems with color line, mm -hmm. and also in so the black folks. Mm -hmm. But I wonder was if you look at that document, uh, Du Bois was not in charge of that. He was the corresponding secretary. They probably chose him to write the document. It needs to be studied further. And I don't, mm. Because the head of it was Henry Sylvester Williams. Mm -hmm. And the other guy, what was the bishop at the first Pan-African Congress? Was it Walls? What was his name with Henry Sylvester William? One was the secretary and one... You mean the one in 1919 in Paris? No, no I mean the one, the first one. In 1900? With, yeah, with Sylvester. Uh, what was the name of that bishop? I got to think. But Du Bois was a youngster. He was, mm -hmm. no, in, in 1903, Du Bois was 35 years old. Mm -hmm. These were old pros, you know, mm -hmm. but 
So, you know, when we read that, are we reading the position of Du Bois at that time, or are we reading the position of the conference, and he was dedicated, because he's very well educated, as the person to write the position? Right. Yeah, you know, because mm. he was not in charge of the first Pan-African Congress, mm -hmm. you know. Okay, uh, right. I, I'm trying to think. So you say, was he in charge of which position? Of the one... What was that, in 1902 or 1903? The first Pan-African Congress mm -hmm. was at the start of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And in that, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. Mm -hmm. But again, that's the isolated quote. People haven't read the document. What the, I'm going to get to where Garvey, because sure, sure. Garvey was not a part of that movement. So Garvey's movement, what, see, the African nationalists had moved away from, from the notion, which is understandable in the 19th century, the Western world was so powerful that the blacks, Pan-African movement, is that they should uh, be a lubricant right. for the deepening relations of blacks all over the world to fight against a Western domination. And many of them... And this is not peculiar to Africa, because I studied the, my master's was on the Indonesian movement, which is mm -hmm. parallel. I don't want to get off on that. But the point is that, uh, uh, but Coffee and all those guys were talking about changing the approach of the Western democracies to how they deal with colonies. Mm -hmm. That was in the Chinese movement, mm -hmm. too. In the uh, because an in Indian in the early phases is a parallel, uh, um, and what happens is the movement was not an anti-colonial movement; it was a movement for autonomy within the British and French Empire to have more rights within the framework of the existing system. It was not a movement to break with the system. Now, in the pan F, and you saw that in, if you read the whole document of uh, the first Pan-African Congress, they were calling for something that the Congo should, Belgium should give that up, and that'd be an independent state. But they also called for the British and the French to change their policy toward the colonies to give them equal rights within the framework of their respective empires. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, that was the same thing in the American colonial movement. Mm -hmm. The American colonial movement during 1776 did not call initially for separation. Mm -hmm. It called for equal rights to Britishers, Englishmen yeah. overseas, right. Right. and in to that you had in England. And not to have oppressive laws and it took Thomas Paine and others with his right. common sense to come right. in. Right. No, you, you, common sense tell you these people aren't going to give you your rights. So common sense tell you, you that you, you got to take it and separate. But number two, so Du Bois is having this movement, uh, is a part of this movement, and then uh, the Pan-African, then Martin, uh, in a sense, Garvey is a resuscitation of the notion of the pan-Negro movement, mm -hmm. of a Negro nation. In fact, Garvey actually said, don't you see, this is not as big a threat to you as these anti-colonial African nationalists who want to separate from your empire. Mm -hmm. Now, Garvey never advocate that Africans separate from the empires of the West. Check it out. Maybe I'm wrong. But there's no evidence that he ever advocated. He advocated a Negro nation that can relate a pan-Negro whose borders are not just the United States, and it kind of privileged the positions of, of Negroes in the diaspora. Implicit. It. it was not only in Du Bois, it was implicit, I mean Garvey, yeah, yeah. it was implicit in Blyton, it was implicit in Crumel. The civilizing mission, 
because all of them accepted the fact the best system in the world. Now, Crumel was uh, Anglophile, was British democracy. British democracy. And we don't want to separate from that. We want to have you to give us equality within the framework of your system. Now, this is not peculiar. This to is this is your this is what you're saying is was Garvey's. Yeah. So Garvey's flaw, movement, so to speak. It, well, you or could call it a flaw, or however you want to flaw, describe it, or difference. Difference in the split, mm -hmm. because Du Bois's movement was never a pan-Negro movement. It was not a movement to change the relationship between blacks in the diaspora and blacks in Africa. It was a movement for African independence, which is not the same. Now we have that problem today. But I'm maybe I'm wrong. I don't. I, I'm not arguing that you're wrong. I'm, I'm. It's it's probably more likely I don't understand. But but wouldn't Garvey's pan Negroness and the call for African control of Africa? And African communities, wherever African people are, isn't that in it, isn't that itself a split from right? And it's a split that continues. But I'm saying, but isn't that the, isn't that the same as the split the, you're saying that the right, boys call right. for? That's right. It's a split in in what is the aim of your Pan African movement. But that's what I'm saying. Wouldn't but isn't Garvey but isn't Garvey's call for that the yes. same? Ending up at the same. Uh, uh, separation from the colonial elite, but you're, you, in other words, so not you're, necessarily. Okay, I hear. You. I see. You. I'm I not sure. I, 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 now, I, I, one I thing you, is you. the people in Africa rejected that. In fact, they actually rejected Nkrumah. The African leaders, mm. see, Nkrumah was a pan Negro. He was for the all African mm -hmm. nation. Mm -hmm. That is not the position of Secretary, the Ngoabi, Nyeri, Lumumba. These people were talking about. So even when Nkrumah and Sekou Ture were, were when Ture was. But as they worked together, they had different they concepts. Had different concepts. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got to go back and check that. Sekou Ture, they didn't call. And you might want to look at the articles, if I can find them, in General Modern African Studies, where they combine. Because there was a struggle within Africa. Yeah. How are we going to organize, like, like the African, this is called the organization, why, and I need to study that more, why did they change the organization of African Union? They changed it to African Union. Yeah, well, OAU to African Union, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a union of states right. rather than all African nation fighting against. So the right, because right, I, that I've understood that the AU is not the OAU That's vision right. of Nkrumah. That's right. It's, it's, it's more short than the Yeri idea, right. which mm. is a union of states rather than a a union of Africans in an African nation. Now that gets another question, because I suspect, without knowing for sure that the future stage of history is the civilizational state rather than the nation state. Mm -hmm. Well, it's one thing to say it, but the question, that's, you see that implicit in the pan-Arab movement? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when Samir Amin's book on the Arab nation? Yeah. But the Arab said, I'm not an Arab first. I, Arab to some people is that's no linguistic community, but right. my nation is Egypt. Right. And my nation is Syria, even though there was a border of union, the United Arab Republic, when they tried to unite Syria with Egypt. But I don't want to get off on that tangent, because it didn't last long. That doesn't mean it was wrong. But I'm trying to get back to the split with Garvey is by the time you get to the 20s, uh, Du Bois was further to the left. He had gone, that's why a lot of people try to freeze Du Bois at the stage of souls of black folk. Because yeah, uh, right, right. 
Du Bois at that time he lived. He wrote for another sixty years, and people right. keep quoting that one thing he said in nineteen o three or whatever. But he wrote a call of qualification under in the fiftieth anniversary hmm. of Souls of Black Folks in nineteen fifty three. Mm. He qualifies his color question, problem of twentieth century color question, as a color line. He said, "There's still the color line, but there's something deeper." So you were to look up his 1953 review preface to Souls of Black Folks, in which he qualified that particular statement, uh, and he went from anti-colonialism to anti-imperialism. Mm -hmm. See, a lot of people are anti-colonial without being anti-imperialist. Now that yeah, is that's that, confusing to me because I don't know how you could be one without the other. I mean, anti -colonial, I colonialism was part of the process of imperialism. So how could you be anti the symptom you, and not the cause? Well, obviously, they went over to Lenin's concept of imperialism. Mm. Imperialism as opposed to Cecil Rhodes. Mm. See, Cecil, Cecil Rhodes' concept of imperialism would lead to an anti-colonial struggle. Once you do that, you stay within the imperialist system. But sometimes... Well, then you have transformed yourself from a colony to a neo-colony. You have not completed the process. Of overthrowing the... Of, yeah. Mm -hmm. They call it the anatomy. The Russian positive the notion of the anatomy of liberatory movements, anti-colonial, national democratic, socialism, and how to bypass the capitalist stage. Now, they developed a whole theory of that called non-capitalist development, which they practiced in Central Asia and other places, but it's become a fight. Gorbachev rejected that notion as a ruthless social experiment. But I don't want to get off on that tangent. But the point is that, uh, uh, getting back to the, so by the, so, the difference between Garvey and Du Bois was not just on black-white relations, but their social outlook. I it's, gotta go right up a few blocks and pick up somebody in their car stop. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay. Their social outlooks were different. Now I don't know the details on the the collaboration of Du Bois with the state. Now Du Bois well, he just worked with, in the, what was this, in the, in the uh, I wonder if I, if I remember correctly, it was around the, the, uh... Right, don't let me take this down when we go. Okay. I'll be right back in a minute. It was around, uh, I want to say early 1920s, where he took the position that Garvey was uh, something along the lines of anti-American, and he wanted to work with the government to have him deported. Um... And this is something that you know that comes uh, up, particularly around uh, certain in, in certain nationalist circles, as part of their their. And I'll tell you how it usually ends up playing out: that that becomes part of the nationalist, or what I might call the narrow nationalist critique of Du Bois, that because he was so Eurocentric, and so uh, um, well, yeah, Eurocentric, yeah. that he would turn on Garvey. Um, and that's how they also make these connections into disparaging even discussions of socialism. As them, right. at that being Eurocentric, so the, the whole yeah, that's like, that's a heck of a jump too, because some socialism is new Eurocentric. <laughs> See, that's a, that, that's a, I just told you that the Western Marxists are Eurocentric, right. all of them. But one of the reasons why I want to document and help you document <laughs> your 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 per perspective is because the problem I have is that, and, and I feel it on both sides, so so to speak that in the, the African-centered nationalist community, they don't know enough about the, the strands of Marxist traditions or that history. That's right. They, and Indian, vice versa. Does in, are Indian Marxists from India Eurocentric? <laughs> well, this one would say yes. And that's why, and, and that's why I'm saying... They haven't read Didi Kosan. But that's my point. And, but, but, and, and the flip side, I would argue, is also Why don't you read the Indian Marxists on Mar Indian Marxism? No, no, but that's what I'm saying, that there isn't enough interaction so, yes, that, so that those who would be conversant in the Marxist world of traditions yeah. are not conversant in many of the African-centered world of traditions that's of right. discussions and vice versa. And yet these two communities still 
dominate what I what I'm calling for the sake of this conversation the black left. Now I don't that, that's not what I'm, I know you mean by left. But, yes, but, yes, but, but but of all those who are saying we need some sort of revolution in that, that group, that leads to an interesting country because then the revolution <laughs> becomes the black white revolution, and it's put them out of the major struggle on the planet Earth right now. You mean put who out? The black nationalists. Mm. Because the major struggle against Western domination is not a struggle between blacks and white. It's a struggle for the multipolar world order, mm. which is anti-Western. It is not anti-Western. Mm. It's anti-Western domination. See, I'm not anti-Western because in your effort to dominate, it resulted it won in two world wars already about who's going to do the dominating among the Western country, and number two could could lead because otherwise you don't understand the Ukraine. And I never forget what the Arab Spring hit me immediately. Well, how are we going to sabotage the Arab Spring? Mm -hmm. Because we cannot have the Arab people overcome all these autocratic governments in unity because that would mean that we would have a situation <laughs> speaking in terms of political economy mm -hmm. there's a new field called geoeconomics incidentally right, right, right. Uh, in which if the Arabs did like or the OPEC countries did like China we had to just own international financial architecture, it would change the whole character of the world. Mm. Namely, example. Mm. You know, China has three and a half trillion dollars worth of currency reserve. Now, I don't want to get off on that because that's going to be redirected. It's been basically flowing into bonds and so forth. Do you realize the OPEC country has twice as much? They got seven trillion dollars wow. worth of currency reserve. The OPEC and, nations combined. That's right. Yeah. It's not mostly Middle East, but the, you know, there's Venezuela right, and so that's forth. Right, that's right. If they redirect it, can you imagine what they could do with their country if they used that money for domestic development? It was a change of hope, but it was changed of hope. They can't, we can't, we would prefer them to have chaos and do that. That's mm. why we can't deal with Saudi Arabia, which is the biggest, what you call it. And that's why I don't want to get off on too much of a tangent. The only country that was not using the majority, and everybody's stealing, mm. including Libya's people. So that's a whole nother question when you have a state sector. Right, right. <laughs> that's, that's under socialism, too. Somebody going to be stealing the state treasury. I don't know. Of course, in China, you get caught. They, they say they, okay. you get the death yeah, sentence. Sure do. That's right. <laughs> they, they get the death sentence. <laughs> 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 But still, people gonna steal. Of they, course. They, 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 well, we know very well. Uh, so this <laughs> country alone, the death penalty is not a deterrent. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It's right. just not. So, as I mean, we used to say, the cynics said, honesty is the art, art of not getting caught. Yeah, that's right. But, that's <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> if you don't get caught, you're still honest. It's not a <laughs> it, it, right. the, the ubiquity. I don't want to get over the corruption because yeah. everybody. What is that in the paper today? Somebody somewhere in some country, or. I'm new down in Venezuela. That's the people stealing like so. <laughs> but that. But that's why I always like that line, and I bring it up all the time in these debates that I have. That that, that Kwame Ture said. I love that line. You don't judge socialism by socialists any more than you would judge Christianity by Christians. You <laughs> judge it. them on their principles. That's right. You can't judge them on their application. Uh, otherwise, we'll get bogged down. We can't. We can't move anywhere. Um, and you. That's the what. That and that's what's it. What's that? That old famous play, Dead Souls, mm, I don't know. by Gogol, uh, oh, yeah, the I don't 19th know. century Russian writer. Yeah. But it's really about a person using all these dead people to save on his taxes and so forth. Oh, wow. <laughs> so you're not going to eliminate it. So the person, all you got to do is contain it and then prosecute it when it turns. I don't want to get off on the tangent. But so you getting back to the Garvey Du Bois, I think Garvey went to the right. That is a pattern in black 
not all black mm -hmm. leaders, including A. Philip Randolph. Mm -hmm. A. Philip Randolph was to the quotation mark to the left of Du Bois, anti working class position, anti black position. See, Du Bois had nuance on that because he says, yeah, but what about these trade unions and this racial exclusivity? I support trade unions in general, but I don't put support trade unions who are excluding blacks from the workforce. Does that mean? Good morning. How you doing? All right. Is that the world? He just ran out to run an errand. Uh, he said he'll be back shortly, though. You, welcome. So, so you had that differences. Now, now what happened is. So in this, but what happened with Garvey? He appealed. It's what you call peasant nationalism, because mm. he appealed, and they. And this happens all over the world, is that you have what they call populist movement. And I use that word advisedly because ruling class calls all movement of the people populist movement. Mm. And populist, should not movement be popular? Of course they should. But is that the same? But I know from studying, and I'm not the only one. That has not never been a successful populist movement in history. Mm. Uh, where the, a populism, because mm. it's an effort, and mm. a populist leader has, populist leaders have something in common with elitist leaders. They both have contempt for the masses that they lead. You're supposed to follow them. Now, the elitists don't even want you. The difference is the elitists has contempt for the masses and try to demobilize them. Right. But the populist movement never developed their constituency. They want a band of followers. You know, it gets to that question of revolution from above and revolution from below. And the answer the question sounds very complicated. You have to have a revolution from above and below at the same time. <laughs> now, there's one thing to say that, <laughs> but it's another thing to put content into that statement. But anyhow, uh. I'm a professional, buddy. I'm, I don't want to flatter me. I know more about this than probably anybody. I, I, I've been at it 60-some years, and I, I don't let up. Clearly. I, I don't spend, I'm, I'm studying the Empire and Barbarians, the birth of European civilization. Uh. And uh, the birth, it's like all these books, Chancellor, all them are distortion. There were no Europeans in, in Western Asia at the time of the Egyptians. <laughs> the Greeks were mercenaries, they were the barbarians. Yeah, no, no, I know, but who, who but I don't remember Chancellor Williams making that claim. Yeah, well, well, uh, that Europeans the, the, from Western Asia. The, the destruction of black, black civilization. Yeah. Yeah. Does he make that? I don't remember. It's been a while since I read it. Did he make that? Well, there has been. Well, <coughs> I don't know. There is no civilization hmm. that has been destroyed by barbarians until they're already rotten at the core, hmm. and the barbarians come in and, and take it, take it and, over. Yeah. That's the right of the Greeks. Hmm. I think. Asian civilization reached a stage. I think there was a counter-revolution. I can't prove it because that not, social history is inadequate. I think there was a counter-revolution in Egypt when Ignatius tried to change the whole system, mm -hmm. and the reactionary one former took it, tried to set up monotheism. And incidentally, Ignatius, my niece tells me that was monolatry, but I don't want to get off on that tangent. But the point is. So what you have is that, but by the time you get to 30, Bugarvi has thoroughly disintegrated. He supported Mussolini and so forth. But what happened is a tendency in nationalist movement to go to the right. Mm -hmm. That's not a black tendency. Mm -hmm. That's what happened in the Indonesian movement. That's what happened in American history. Who was the leaders? Who were the political leaders 
of the American Revolution. George Washington and the Federalist Party. What happened to it? <laughs> they, went, they were ready to sell out to the British because they were, what you have <laughs> in national movement is unity on a broad perspective right. until you get in power. And we want to make a deal, not John Adams, he should be noted from that, but they want to make a deal with the British to contain it. Mm. They want formal independence, but we don't want to give up that good thing of, of doing business with the, with, with the most that's, advanced that's right. empire in the world. That's right. You know what Thomas Paine said about that when he said, we can't give up that. He said, we don't have to worry about doing business with the British as long as they have the habit of eating. Because mm. Americans send in food. Mm. The British lived off of the American agriculture. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, mm -hmm. I don't get off on that tent. Right. But this is what happens mm. in movement. Now, now, there's also that metastasis of despair when you're frustrated mm -hmm. or when you are advocating, and this is what's happening with the black movement now. The black leaders of the 60s, almost like the abolitionist black leaders before the Civil War, that's up and including Frederick Douglass, mm -hmm. which is almost heresy. Mm -hmm. Frederick Douglass was irrelevant after, world, after the Civil War. He opposed the new movement. When what you call it, Thomas and others trying the independent political action Afro-American League, he said the Republican Party is the ship of state, all else is the sea. Yeah. People who leave the Republican Party, how are you going to give up on Lincoln? There's a book called Farewell to the Party of Lincoln. But that's another question. But, uh, 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 the, uh, wow, and that represents, that represents a tremendous problem still to this day. Because these people think, and sometimes people want to resuscitate movements in the past. A lot of black leaders, especially some older guys, I'm not an older guy, I've just been young a long time. <laughs> I have my illusions at least. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got to laugh at this it's bullshit. A good yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They want to bring back the movement of the 60s. It's over. First, Martin and Malcolm was getting ready to take it to another state. Right. See, Malcolm and well, I am not sure that, yeah. that, and Mal I don't think Malcolm's going to become a social democrat. Ain't no way for me to prove it one way or another. You're going to talk on that. Well, that's what I was saying <laughs> earlier. There's just no evidence to suggest that. People, that's right. people continue to make that argument. They're just doing it on sheer speculation because there's because nothing they, he did while alive that would suggest to you that he was going to become a social democrat. That's right. That's all I can say. Well, then he's going to be outside the tradition of Robeson and divorce because mm -hmm. Robeson, you should read here, I stand. I have, yeah. You remember his, what he stated about white liberals? He, he, said, uh, he said... Very critical. That's right. He said some people are, in the days of Booker T. Washington that if we don't follow Booker T, I, I'm not quoting him right, mm -hmm. then we're outside the movement. But today, it's not the Booker T. Washington. That's right. It's the white liberals in which you cease or undertake actions on the basis of their approval. But our needs are far deeper. I think, I actually, I'm speculating, I think Robeson was declaring his, and he was tired of his bullshit because they done messed up his career for one thing. Well, yeah. But, that, but, yeah. but I think he was tired of being used by the white left. Oh, I think that's clear. And I think and I think this is one of the things, and his, his son didn't put it this way, uh, in fact, because I think his son was more interested in the moment that, that I'm talking about in defending his own choice to marry a white woman and, and the choice of anyone to marry a white partner. In that, but in that moment, I think that Robeson Jr. was missing that part of what his father was saying, um, and argued that that uh, um, the response of the international elite uh, 
Now, again, Ropes Jr. didn't make this point, but I, I'm filling in my own perspective here. That to your point, that once he started becoming critical, overtly critical of white liberals, which which shows the stagnation of these these as we were talking about earlier, these these uh, um, uh, 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 at least the potential stagnation of these interracial That's movement, that that the that the the empire stepped up its assault on him. Because it's after, if I have the chronology right, right it's after right. that time that that's when he starts, he got that, he got that MK Ultra disappearance. They just snatched him up in England, I think. And his, his, uh, uh, Robeson Jr. went through a whole presentation on this and, and, and argued that by the end of his life, the man that people saw struggling in the 70s in Philadelphia uh, was, a, was a physically conquered psychologically conquered person. Yeah, that's right. Um, because of these... these uh, um, that's the metastasis of despair. But that's also the drugs and the, 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 yeah. the psychological warfare right. uh, that was in, in, enforced on him. Um, that's right. But by the way, I mean, but that's, but that's a point that I think a lot of people miss, that, that every single... I'm not... You would, you would correct me on this. I'm that's not every of, single black no, leader's going through that. I'm telling I'm, you. Specifically I, I, this I issue with white liberals, really, though. Huh? That's, specifically this critique of white liberals a, is what I'm talking right, about. That's though. right. That's yeah. right. It goes back to Kurt Douglas' critique of William Lloyd Garrison. Right, right. How dare you, after all I've done for you people, right. you come up here and set up a separate newspaper. Right. We got the Liberator. Right. And okay, Bob, I'm cutting you off because I know you can be here for the next 10 hours, man. <laughs> this is Conrad. You understand? Well, when you going to give your talk? What, what we're trying to do today is to put in, in context the 21st century, where mm -hmm. we are as African people, whether in America and Africa, Latin and Central America. Um, up, in, up until, let's say, 1960s and the modern-day civil rights movement and the event of the independence of African countries, uh, black people, African people, were an integral part mm -hmm. of, of the international movement and the motor force for change in most of the countries uh, that they were in, such as the United States. Now we see um, that, that there's very little connection between the African-American community, the African community, and Latin America in the dialogue that's going on around uh, the making of a new global economy. So, so actually, Bob, what we want you to do is, is to do several things, bring us up to date historically, and then put, put that in context of where we are today. Yes. As I said previously, we always have put our struggle in the international context, whether it be the 19th century, not just the black nationalism, but the freedom, the other two trends are. Paul Coffey, in the 19th century, people were in both trends, but I, I don't want to get spend too much time with that, but uh, Douglas, uh, Frederick Douglass, uh, uh, T. Thomas Fortune, there's some forgotten people who are, who were very fundamental in uh, uh, this international context. T. Thomas is one of them. I don't know why he's not a part of the Pantheon of Heroes. Uh, um, and of course, Du Bois, etc. But one thing about that, though, we we were in the context of the anti-colonial stage of history for Africans and our, 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 our first slavery and segregation as the uh, legal segregation, because I don't think segregation has ended. Uh, uh, and I see uh, Jesse Jackson just recently said that we're going to a radical resegregation of the United States. And that concept needs to be uh, given some attention uh, in a new form. Uh, uh, but so therefore we have been I'll uh, uh, combine our national struggle, our, our race struggle, with our uh, uh, international. But now we're in a post-colonial period. And in the post-colonial period, uh, the predominant form of the struggle is this 
first thing to struggle overseas against neocolonialism, against other forms of neocolonialism, but there's a counter move. There's a counter move uh, uh, in, the, in especially outside the Western world and in what we call the irresistible rise of the East, if I might quote from Mabutani's interesting book, The Next Asian Hemisphere, The Irresistible Rise of the East. Now, you mentioned the Bandung Conference in 1955. Incidentally, that caused, when it was called, it caused a split. Du Bois was very interested in that. The NECP at that time looked askance upon the... Uh, us, uh, and uh, what I have seen throughout the history of this country uh, is that even our white allies look askance when we try to put our struggle in the international context. Uh, and, you know, Martin Luther King as well as Malcolm X did the two. Unfortunately, they were killed in the prime of their lives at 39 years old. Uh, um, but so therefore, the, but, but there's new task because not only we're in the post-colonial period, but we seem to be, and I use these words advisedly, in the post-industrial period uh, in society. And this has implication as to strategy and the so-called end work phenomena and how the Afro-Americans fit within that, especially when... And I hope there is another trend uh, in relationship to the Western world. The dominant thrust led by the United States is to thwart the irresistible rise of the East, uh, to quote Mabutani. Now, they can't stop it. Now, at the 55th, at the 50th anniversary of the Bandung Conference, they called for an Afro-Asian strategic alliance. Now, this strategic alliance was not a military alliance. They were talking about uh, a South-South dialogue, as they call it, and new forms of resistance to the economic domination of the Western world. And um, this, uh, this is indicative that they did not intend to leave Latin America out, uh, Within a month after that meeting, they met, and that was in 2005, uh, they met in Cuba to indicate the multi-alignment movement. Some people said we should change the term from non-aligned movement to multi-alignment. Now, that was the proposition put forth by Shasti Thoreau in his book, uh, Pax uh, Indica, who was the Deputy Secretary General under Kofi Annan. So what we're talking about is this new stage of history, and we might be in an axial age, A-X-I-A-L. And there's a lot of literature on that. And this is civilizational. But within this civilizational crisis is a profound economic crisis of, uh, of the capitalist economy. And it's a very interesting thing because what is ha And in addition to that, the world economy has moved away from the Cold War in its old forms. In fact, some people think we're trying to restore the Cold War. But that's a whole other question. In the Cold War, uh, I found my quote for the person who probably pithily described that period better than any, his name was Vladimir Lenin. He said, the reciprocal relation between nations is determined by the struggle of the socialist camp and a small insignificant portion of the world's population in the capitalist world. He who does not understand this proposition cannot come to the correct conclusion on national colonial situation. That period of history is over. What is the, the new times that we're in now? We're in a time of reciprocal relations. Is the struggle for what will be the time of this civilizational epoch? Uh, will it be a, a, a struggle, a clash of civilization, which I think it comes from Samuel Huntington, among others, uh, who's dead now, or an alliance for civilization? As uh, Mr. Kovianan, I don't think he's an architect of this. But
But these, these people are putting this in a civilizational context. You can't understand the Ukrainian thing or the way that, that we have, with the help of their own, messed up the Arab Spring, which is uh, uh, the, the overthrow of Libya. If you put it in a broader context, you will see, and I'm going to stop at that point, because Afro-Americans at this time uh, is complicated. It's, it's not like it used to be, because it's, it's not a clear anti-colonial struggle. Incidentally, in the anti-colonial struggle, starting in the 19th century, we began to have a problem, which can exist today, between the approach of Afro-Americans to Pan-Africanism and the approach of Africans. Not only Cromwell, which the Africa, the presumption of people in the diaspora was that they were going to lead the alleged set the uh, position for Pan-Africanism. And that was a split between them and, uh, as well as with Edward Wilman Blyton because they did not accept what is loosely called the Pan-Negro approach, which Du Bois had for a while, but he eventually moved away from it. And we have, it culminated in the 1973 uh, uh, Pan-African Congress, which Nyeri adjourned much as she granted some people Cindy D, without a date, which means we are not going to make this struggle in that form. Now, Afro-Americans had difficulty dealing with what do you mean if, if the Pan-African movement will not be predominantly determined by recommendations coming for people in the diaspora. Of course, uh, uh, but that's but that's an interesting. So blacks, a lot of them were very upset at that conference. That's back in 1973. I didn't go. Some of my friends went. Uh, but anyhow, so we are in a heck of a dilemma. Uh, if uh, if our country is going to attempt unsuccessfully, even though they kill a bunch of people, to resist the irresistible rise of the East. Bob, let me, let me, let me just stop you uh, for mm -hmm. a moment to ask you to maybe clarify a couple of things you said. There. All right. For those of you on the phone, uh, after the first hour, this, we scheduled to go for two hours. Uh, in the second hour, we would, we would open it up for, for questions. So, well, you don't do that. I don't like a monologue myself. But go ahead. <laughs> okay, well, well, I might run out of things to say. <laughs> go ahead. Sure but you, you threw out some terms. One was the actual age. Yes. Uh, and the second thing, you tried to put the Ukrainian situation into a broader historical uh, context. Right. Uh, what do you mean by actual age? Now, it's not my idea. It's uh, our studies of ice and start, uh, or in which they talked about certain actual ages. Now, what he called actual age was the period of the rise of China under Confucius, the Greeks, you know, and the various people, Buddha and Zarathustra, and that he contend was an actual age. Some people spooked, uh, disputed that, including Bernal. He said, uh, but, but I, my thought is that uh, but then another actual age is when the fundamental organization of the world has changed. And it's not just a change from one socioeconomic formation to another, but it's usually accompanied by that. And, uh, but, but if you're in such an age, the birth of the new age can lead to a time of trouble. And I think we are in a time of trouble because uh, people don't want to give up uh, their privileged position in the world economy. And that's why Huntington proposed the clash of civilization uh, because, uh, and uh, especially in the United States, because our whole social being, in some time it takes the form of product white, but the whites are ready, ready to compromise with colored people up to a point, 
provided they accept the notion of the universalization of Western values in this actual age. But an act that means the world will change on its axis. We had previous one, the rise of the West was an axial age. Prior to the rise of the West, Europe was insignificant in world affairs. Uh, Europe uh, didn't, there's new studies on Europe, has a study, uh, empires and barbarians. The new study is that Greco Roman was not even Europe. It might have been proto, but the, the, the birth of Europe was around 300 some AD, around the time of the Council of Nicaea. And then they call themselves Europeans, but Christendom. But then uh, there's other actual ages, one in the so-called Dark Ages, when the, uh, it's only dark if you were in Western Europe. The whole, I don't want to get off on Europe too much, because the whole way that people have studied Europe is off. Because the main motion was not from Rome to Western Europe. It was from Rome to Eastern Europe, and then subsequently to Western Europe. And I don't want to discuss that too much. All right, okay, Rob. Uh, you, you mentioned several times the irresistible rise of the East, which is obviously centered around the rise of China. But this is not the first time that, that China has been uh, dominant in world affairs, and there have been other points in history where the, the Moors were dominant, uh, dominant civilization. Not the Moors, the Muslims. The Muslims. Yeah, uh, the Moors was an outpost. The center of uh, Muslim culture was Baghdad, not not North Africa. But go ahead. Yeah. So, so when you talk about the irresistible rise of the East, what is different about this time than its previous times when 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 China was a major player? Yes, yeah, sir. Oh, yeah. Well, people, don't, we our whole concept of history is going to have to change. I, if I was young, so I was studying some Chinese. And I'm reading a little bit on China, but you know, and India. China, as late as 1800, had more economic production than all of Europe and the United States put together. They call these hundred years uh, centuries of humiliation. So our whole concept of the world has been. Eurocentrist and our, in our interpretation of the Middle East as the destruction of black civilization and as if the Middle East in 1200 B.C. was not predominantly dark skinned. You know, uh, the, the, I know now that light skinned people coming from northern part of Asia into uh, Western Asia, which is proper term rather than Middle East, that's Eurocentrist, was recent. So, um, so what you have is the it's a period of history which we think is normal, but it's only normal for a certain period of history. Now, uh, uh, now, what is happening is what will be the forms of transition that will allow the human race not to destroy itself with interminable wars is not a class of civilization, but an alliance of civilizations. And that's what the BRICS rep represent, uh, uh, which is called for a multipolar world order. It's not exclusive. You can join it. Uh, even the United States, if you decide to accept the fact that you're not the only indispensable nation, uh, which is hard for people to do. Now, it's hard for... Uh, so, there's been other periods like this. Uh, uh, there's probably... I think the rise of ancient Egypt and the Harappa and all around 3200 B.C. was an actual age. And uh, uh, predominantly in, then you get in the Southeast Asia, which is a, there's a book by Oppenheimer called Eden in the East which the Chinese are not ready to accept, is that this civilization actually started in Southeast Asia rather than further north. But anyhow, so in these ages, you not only have a, a change in civilization, but it's usually accompanied by mass changes in population location, uh, like in Europe, they call it the folk of wandering, the wandering of the people. 
uh, in which a large number of people from Asia moved into Europe to intermingle with the light-skinned African-looking people who already live there, but that's another question. So in these ages, you usually have, and that's why we have to deal with that in terms of migration problems. If you put them in a broad context, and some people in power know it, there's going to be tremendous changes in locate in demographic changes, in changes in level of productivity. Now we are actually in an age where with our level of productivity we could there's no reason for there to be poverty in the world. That's why you have these proposals, millennium development strategies, sustainable development strategies and others, uh, which cannot be done in relationship uh, uh, to uh, without a fundamental change in social economic relations. And one of the features of this actual age, which is in an incipiency, is the rise of possible civilizational states. There's only two now, China and in India, and other aspired, European aspired to that with the European Union, but they can't go to the next stage because they're trying to have a civilizational state on neoliberal principles, which they can't do, uh, and, that's a, uh, and that's a problem that they have to wrestle with or else. And I'm going to tell you this, the key to the Western civilization not declining will not be determined by what happens in the United States. The center of Western civilization is Europe, and it consists of three component parts. Europe, North America, excluding Mexico, and Latin America, presumably Judeo-Christian civilization. Now, the Muslim civilization is in a deep-seated crisis, and the people are going to play on their disunity to try to prevent them going to the next stage of history. Now, if we were uh, 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 really internationalist, civilizational internationalism, uh, then we would have helped the Arab Spring move to democracy. And that's a tricky question in terms of democracy as an ideology. But that's another question. But I don't know when I answer your question. Well, you, you, you mentioned, you, you keep mentioning, you, what is, how do you define a civilization, civilizational state? You mentioned China and India. Yeah, because they have a state, uh, and India is not a nation state, you know. See, the nation state, that's an interesting thing, because the nation state as a stage of history was only occurred in Western Europe, and with uh, the, the so-called... Westphalian phenomena, where nation, state, national boundaries, and so forth. The question is, and and uh, I would say, as a result of transplantation of Western civilization in a different way in South America, they had a nation state system. Now, Africans, now all these countries, as a result of uh, being civilizational states, and it goes back thousands of years, going to have a bunch of boundary problems. Because in pre-capitalist societies, you don't have national boundaries. The first time you had national boundaries as a principle was the Treaty of Westphalia, which ended the uh, Thirty Years' War in Europe. But the notion of the inviolability of frontiers, it took them 327 years in Europe before the establishment of national boundaries that they in the boundary disputes. But uh, uh, Russia contends they are a civilizational state, that they are a Eurasian civilization, which has a tricky question and call themselves a multi-confessional civilizational state, namely because they have 
Christians and Muslims and Buddhists in it. And they have to work out that so the problem of the 21st century will not be the problem of the religious line. That's a whole other question, because religion might end up being more important than race in determining international disputes in the 21st century. Uh, if, uh, but that's another question that we have to deal with. But uh, Africa, the whole pan-Negro concept, they had that with the pan-Arab concept, too, was a concept of creating a civilizational state, because Arabs were not a nation, even though some Arab men called it the Arab nation. But that's a tricky question. Uh, 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 and we, some of us call Africa the African nation. Now, now, uh, in relationship to that, there was a split among Africans on that, if you will. Some of you want to look it up, look up Journal Modern African Studies article on the difference between the Yeris concept of Pan-Africanism and Nkrumah. Nkrumah had more of the Pan-Negro and African nation near Nyeri, more a nation of states, uh, 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 which could, in the future, led to uh, uh, a union of states. That's why the idea in Europe was good of notion of shared sovereignty, etc., between national sovereignty and sovereignty of the European Union. But it didn't work out uh, well because they did not have, that cannot be an advanced civilizational state if you have backwards socioeconomic ideas. I hope I answered it. I don't know. Uh, Jared? I think uh, 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 you, you've given us uh, a good uh, kind of o- overview, mm. uh, but let's bring some specificity into right. the discussion. Uh, uh, where do you see uh, Africa, the continent of Africa, in this concept of the irresistible rise? of the East. Uh, w- yes. Now, what you're talking about is the politics of this period of history for decades, I'm telling you, uh, between people. Uh, there's some Africans, as you know, they were part of in the invested strategic alliance of African Asia, the non-aligned movement, or the multi-aligned movement, as some of them call it now. But uh, some Africans... Now, what the uh, West is going to do is because it will be easier for you to get rich personally in a hurry if you opt to join the West in their effort, because they will have to make historic compromises as they did to sabotage the Pan-American movement in the 19th century uh, with, yeah, with African elites. And if you notice what they're saying, and it's a compromise in which, so the question is, will Africans, for selfish reasons, some of them, go for this compromise? And it is a fact they can get rich quicker if they do not participate in the all-around development of their societies as opposed to uh, uh, developing in relationship to the Western world. So this is going to be the nature of politics as it is in South America, as it will be in Southeast Asia. That's why the whole Trans-Pacific Partnership. But Africa, the struggle will be, and I would say, uh, as you see them saying, because they know this, they talk about the middle class. And that's not only in Africa, that's in the developed world too. If we stay on this, in quotation mark, zero sum solution, which comes from Rockman's book, Zero Sum Future, uh, who uh, uh, writes for the uh, Financial Times, uh, um, then uh, Africans will be split. They would be split on this question. And there's some African that would pursue 
attempt to pursue a progressive course, but they will be, and others. But the strategy uh, is to appeal to an African middle class uh, who will become the, the part of the structure of the metropolitan production. And others who see it will be much more difficult to do all sided development of your people. And Africa has a problem because they don't have the benefit that Europe had when it was rising as nation states won. Europe ripped off half the world in the process. Uh, uh, and nor do they have a superior force outside Africa intervening to make sure that in their process of development, they take a pro-Western course. As I said, I don't know of any, any Western countries taking who have a pro-Eastern strategy, which to me would be more conducive to world democracy, since out of 7 billion people on the planet Earth, at least 6 billion people don't live in, in the West. But Africa, that's going to be the politics of the next decade. And Africa is a part of the South-South dialogue. Now, now, as you know, one of the BRIC nations is uh, South Africa, and Brazil is, and uh, I see their strategy is to use these places as ways to get other countries on the continent to join their multipolar initiative. Brazil in relationship to South America, more so because they're much bigger. But in this f framework, what you are, what you're talking about is the politics of probably decades. This is not something that is going to be solved by somebody sitting down and coming up. But what, so Africa does fit in because everybody knows Africa eventually going to be more populous than India and China. It's projected to go up to two billion people. But, and, uh, but uh, unfortunately, they are, uh, they have a lot of pre-modern relationships, which you can exploit, like tribal clans and people with, as you see, the same thing happening in the Middle East, in which these are, some people call them state nations, rather than nation states, like Iraq and uh, Saudi Arabia and other places. But the logic of of a, of a strategy, if they lean toward a true pro-Western position, is to become failed states, uh, uh, because uh, it will, the, the strategy will not lead to the all-sided development of the continent. In a, in a discussion, Bob, uh, on uh, CCTV, and it was a discussion of whether or not China would follow the Western uh, path to democracy or its own path. And when the question of Africa came up, the Chinese position was that the, 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 the West position was to, to divide Africa and to create divisions. And the Chinese spokesman said, China saw the unity of Africa as being in the interest of the future of the world and in relationships with China. What do you think about that? Yeah, yeah. China has a win-win strategy. Now, you have to understand China in, in terms of you can't have a win-win strategy if you take the capitalist path. Capitalism is a zero-sum game in its cell form. Say stock market. How do you win on the stock market? Is to bet against somebody who loses. I mean, so the whole elementary, you can't have a win win strategy. So is China is a civilizational state, but China and India too in a different way, but China is more homogeneous than India because the historic policy of the Chinese to assimilate the ethnic groups that they conquered. That goes back a thousand years. That's why the Han nationality is the biggest nationality on the planet. And uh, but that be will be determined by some, which I don't know the answer to. Uh, state capitalism. What is state capitalism? 
Now, some people say state capitalism is the same as capitalism. No, state capitalism has existed, going back to the ancient world, where you use the state to accumulate wealth. Whether you use that state uh, to accumulate wealth to bolster a slave system, a feudal system, a capitalist system, or a socialist system. As you know, what's his name? Lenin. He was kind of advanced. He said, we want a state capitalism. Here's with conditions that will go over to socialism. Now, these are very sufficient because there's one thing to say that. But China... Can ha you can have a win-win situation if you, the criteria, and this is what is happening with the Asian uh, Investment Bank, the criteria is that the state sector will be at the commanding heights in determining policy, even if, and both. Well, whether or not China, and China got to keep together a civilization, because there's much difference between Yunnan and Peking as there is between Norway and Italy, even though they're all a part of this civilizational state. So, so China, uh, with the China, is a very interesting question. Now, the test of whether this is state capitalism going over the capitalism is whether a China eventually stops developing because eventually you will have a realization crisis, namely uh, that it will not be profitable to extend production. But, uh, 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 but, if, you, uh, but if you don't accede to a realization crisis, then prices will fall. But is I don't want to get into economics, but is deflation necessarily bad? And first, if you know the history of capitalism prior to 1873, the long-range tendency in the Western world for, for prices to fall except during times of crisis. Inflation, that's a whole other question. So with the China, it will be determined by the politics of China. Because in China, there are people who are interested in making money in a hurry, even if it does not conduce to the development of their society. And they're going to face what they call the middle range crisis, where they're going to have to make decisions. But there's a new thing coming along in the world that might influence us. And you should look at the New York Times, Almanac, and so forth, is the notion of PPP. Purchasing power parity, which is different from GDP, but you will see if you examine different countries, in developed countries, PPP and GDP is approximately the same, but including China, but in other parts of the world, the GDP is much lower than the PPP. Now, I don't want to get off on the economics of this, but because the logic of this level of production, if value theory has any relevance, and I, I think it does, after all, we still devalue and revalue currency rather than deprice and reprice them, but that's a whole other theoretical discussion. But uh, so the question in China, and there's various trends in China. There's still the Maoist trend, which has their their forces. There is the Deng Xiaoping trend, and there is the uh, the uh, uh, compromise between the two. Now, I think what has happened in China, and I think is what is being tried in Russia. That's why we do not want Russia's in the intermediate period. But uh, so. This is a question that will be determined by the struggle between political forces in China, which way they go, not only in relationship to Africa, but uh, South America, etc. At this time, if you notice something about Chinese development, I just saw read in the Wall Street Journal yesterday, that China is using their currencies to buy real assets they are going to switch from buying uh, stock securities and bonds as the major thrust of their of their economy, and that has implications in terms because relationships between now China in 
they are they are not going to do what the Soviet Union did. They are not going to make national sacrifices for the international cause. I don't think any other country will ever do that again. So no, no use. But the Russians did make national sacrifice for the international cause, much to the chagrin of a lot of Russians, who are, and some people think that might be why they got in trouble. So, uh, so the, you're talking about the politics of this epoch. This is the politics not only of Africa, but the politics of South America, the, the Brazil. And what you have, I think, is a historic compromise, given the relation of forces of which progressive social-oriented states had to deal with the fact they are in a capitalist world, and how they make these compromises through all compromise when they're necessary. You should always advance your interest as an art to compromise. I don't know whether I answer the question, but how well, does Africa? Now, Africa can go the way it's done before. Firstly, Africa probably has more natural resources than, than the rest of the world combined that has not been explored. The only other place where you don't have exploration, and that's where Central Asian Siberia is important, is that people have not explored the natural resources. But you can use your natural resources for your development if it has nothing wrong with investment, in, in fact, what you call it said that I think in the Yeri, in his East African Journal, if the rate of interest on your investment is less than the increase in productivity as a result of your investment, it is not parasitic. But these are tricky questions of uh, whether, uh, uh, because what you're dealing with is individuals uh, in China, uh, capitalists who do not always make decisions of their particular interest that is in the national interest. If, uh, if, I, hear you, if I hear you uh, uh, correctly, and maybe I'm not, you, you tend more towards Nayeri's position on the development of Africa than, than in Kronos. Well, in relationship to uh, state formation. I think uh, in Kuma, the pan-Negro point of an African nation is trying to jump stages. We've seen that over and over again in pan-Arab movements, that we're going to jump stages. They attempt, I don't think you can jump stages, that, uh, uh, that you have to go through uh, a nation's uh, a pan-Africanism of nation-states rather than an African nation. And that's where we had the split between the black delegation at the Sixth Pan-African Congress and the and the Africans, because Nyeri said that each nation would have one vote. Now, the Af black delegates wanted to vote as individuals. He said, you know, you run a South Side uh, poverty program, I get one vote, and the year you the head of the country, you get one vote. Now, they didn't find that too pleasing. But, uh, I, but the year uh, in Kumas was more idealistic. The probability of there being an African nation is not probable at this stage of history. We are hoping that places like Nigeria and other places can proceed from state nations to nation states because we have within these countries ethnic groups like Yoruba vis-a-vis the Igbo, etc., the Hausa, and the, and hopefully will not lead the probability of uh, civil war, which will hurt their country. And uh, uh, but see, people try. It's idealistic. The same thing happened in the Pan Arab movement, because what you have in these early phases of these movements is probably Western oriented intellectuals, but they who have uh, idealistic 
uh, notions of what the future will be, but it is not expressed in the sentiment of the rank and file peasant in Syria or Iraq or so forth. They they don't consider themselves an Arab nation. Some of them don't even consider themselves a Syrian nation, much less an Arab nation. And that's another problem. The same in Africa uh, uh, is that uh, you had the, the development was the opposite of in Europe where you had some people call them state nations rather than nation state where you had a centralized state before you had a nation. If you study Western Europe, uh, the nation existed before the nation state. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and the rise of the nation was connected with the overthrow of feudalism. The nation. Do you, well, do, go you ahead. See, do you see pan Africanism as an obsolete ideology, or do you see that it still has relevance for the development of Africa and Africans in the diaspora? Yes, I think Pan-Africanism still has relevance, but it has to have a new social content express, expressing the new stage of history. You know, the whole, then the Pan-Africanism in the 19th century, and that's why you had a clash toward the end of the 19th century, was based on the notion with Paul Cuffey and Delaney and Garnett of the civilizing mission as we used to say, the three C's, civilization, commerce, and Christianity, the the civilizing missions of people of African descent <coughs> in the diaspora to alter the policy of the Europeans toward the Africans. Du Bois had that position in his youth. He changed uh, uh, in the World War One, and which he, when which they changed from the pan-Negro position. But I think the pan-Negro position in relationship to Africa might be obsolete now. Uh, we might have jumped stages, but pan-Africanism as a struggle against foreign domination is still valid. A big setback to pan-Africanism was the Libyan thing. They spit in the African face. You know, in uh, the Libyan strife, and that was a big setback, uh, the African nations, 53 nations in the African unions, voted against NATO intervention in Libya, and they intervened anyhow. So what was the reaction? So that was... Uh, it's a very interesting thing. I don't want to get on that too much uh, because the UN resolution did not authorize the intervention to change the state, uh, the regime. It authorized intervention, humanitarian intervention to prevent a civil war. But the Africans uh, have a problem of their unity uh, as states, they also have a problem as uh, of the unity within their states, and uh, it requires some. Because I hope they don't go through what the Arabs did, the man, the, in the, the intervention in in the Arab awakening uh, was uh, a tragedy to the 360 million Arab people. I hope the same thing doesn't happen in Africa. Mm. Why do you say it was a tragedy? Because the intervention of the West promoted the divisions were already there, but they promoted the divisions and they had allies because you have allies, whether it be tribal clan leaders or whether it be feudal lords, like in Saudi Arabia. And when I think about the Arabs, not just the Arab, but the OPEC countries who have $7 trillion worth of currency reserves and can't come up with a development strategy for their nation because a development strategy will require a fundamental change 
in the socioeconomic structures of their society. It's no accident that Saudi Arabia spends more money on armaments uh, in the international market than any other country. I, but uh, uh, and Gaddafi. Another reason hit Gaddafi is Gaddafi was using his currency reserve. If his example was taken by other Arab nations, it would change the whole nature of the role of the petrodollar in holding up the balance of payment crisis in the United States. Uh, 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 the petrodollar uh, being used predominantly in stocks and securities and bonds and not in the development of their own country. Uh, but anyhow. We're going to have one, one final question and then we're going to open it up for questions. Um, you, 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 you mentioned the petrodollars and what have you. China has embarked on a, the development of a new bank. Which That's right. Is called the Asian something infrastructure bank. Investment uh, bank, yes. Investment bank, and the United States was was opposed to this, right? And, lo- and lobbied Britain not to become a founding investor. Since that time, Germany, Italy, France, Australia says it's going to join. Canada says it's going to join. Brit- Brazil announced that it is joining, and Denmark. Um, do you see this as an attempt? to move, not only move away from the dollar, but to challenge the World Bank and, uh, and, and some private discussions we've had. You talk about the financial sector being 20 times more than the gross national product of the world. Do you see this bank as a way of challenging that dominance? Yes. Now, now China, that's not the only bank, because there's another bank that came out of the BRIC meeting in Brazil. Uh, uh, so there's that bank. There's a series of banks. There's the Inter-American Bank. Uh, uh, Marino, who, if you youngsters want to look it up, uh, look up the Marino article in the Inter-American De- Development Bank. I forgot the year was in the Financial Times. So people are developing what is happening, and there's books on it, The Privileged Position of the Dollar, written by Mr. Eichen Green, economic historian. There's also The Dollar Trap written by uh, Prasad, who used to be chief economist at uh, the International Monetary Fund. But the dollar is a privileged currency. And the reason it's a privileged currency, because it's the currency of the biggest international debtor nation on the planet. And it was built into its formative period at Bretton Woods, much to the chagrin of... uh, uh, John Maynard Keynes, who put forth the proposal, but it was modified by Dexter White. But I don't want to get too much on that. So the Chinese Asian, firstly, as opposed to the uh, uh, World Bank, which is more interested in uh, in, in the IMF in giving money to to banks to maintain their monetary sovereignty and less money to what we call the real economy. And you brought up the fact that the the fictitious economy of uh, derivatives and so forth was not 20 times, about 10 times the GDP of the world. The GDP of the world, according to what, around 75 or $80 trillion. And they, some 800, I see one figure had a quadrillion dollars. So that's a whole nother question, is how you, because people do, even the Chinese, they don't want a precipitous undermining of this monetary system, which will lead to a, a depression that will make 2008 look like child's play. So they, their proposal is not uh, in lieu of, uh, but it will put pressure on, on the World Bank to undertake, to stop devoting most of their money to fictitious accumulation. Uh, uh, fictitious accumulation, well, real capital formation, taking money, putting it in 
I'm oversimplifying, raw materials, buying some machinery, hiring somebody to work, and they produce a product that costs more than your cost of production. The rest is fictitious. It doesn't mean it's bad because it can be a lubricant, provided the lubricant is not 10 times bigger than the automobile is lubricated. So <laughs> that's a whole other question. So I think the the Chinese strategy, that's not the only strategy. There's also a strategy of a Chiang Mai initiative. Chiang Mai to get Southeast Asia out of the soup of U.S. forming out their dollar crisis on other countries. Chiang Mai is a soup, but it's also a country in Thailand where there was initial proposal to have uh, an Asian regional currency comparable uh, to the euro, and uh, but what you are witnessing, and some people recognize the end of a stage of history, in which the world cannot live under this, uh, what's it called, exorbitant privilege of the currency. If you look at the uh, Wall Street, I mean the. And, uh, economists, I look at the back of it, you will see the United States is incurring four and five hundred billion dollar deficits in international exchange every year. That don't seem like much in our size of our economy unless you do it 30 years in a row. So, so we have had, and I guess an, another question as to, and some people realize we can't have this whole, uh, what they call it, a defective international financial architecture. Uh, it's gone too far. And um, that's what Putin said. He said we got a defective international financial architecture. And uh, But I don't think the Chinese, because they got three and a half trillion dollars worth of U.S. currency reserves, so they don't want to see the value of the U.S. currency to drop precipitously. But what people are trying to do is, and I think people in Europe understand this, that's why Great Britain jumped on it right away, because they want to continue to be the financial service industry center. That's probably why they didn't join the Eurozone, because that will f facilitate the process by which they would be replaced as the center of finance in Europe by Frankfurt, Germany. But that's a whole other question. Uh, all right, uh, we're going to stop there, let Bob catch his breath uh, <laughs> a second, and uh, we're going to open up uh, uh, the conversations for questions if you have any, but before we do that, let me just say what we're trying to do is, what we're trying to do is to have a series of discussions with Bob Rhodes and other elders who have been in struggle for a long time and bring a lot of intellectual and practical uh experience in terms of struggle uh, to the discussion and, and certainly if you're on this phone call you were selected because you have something uh, to, to, to add to this uh, discussion so we in no way intend for this uh, to be a monologue. Uh, what I'd like for us to do is to kind of uh, see who's on the phone. I'm, I'm Tom Porter and who, who else is on the phone? Speak up. Jeffrey, are you still here? Je Jeffrey Richardson. Hey, Jeffrey, how you doing? Good, good. How are you? That's one of my former well, students. Yes, sir. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. I think this is tremendous. Mark, are you still on the call? Yes, we lost Mark. Uh, yeah, I'm still here. I just, I just muted it. Okay, we're trying to get a sense of who's on, who's on. Uh, because... He almost. Uh, Sali Sa Latif here. Okay. How you doing, Bob? How you doing? Who's this? Sali. Oh, how you doing? How you doing? Okay. All okay, right. well, we're going to, for those of you, if you have some questions, we're going to open the floor up for questions. Oh, wow. Okay. Um,. I'll, 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 I have a question. Uh, actually, I have a two-part question, Bob. Uh, first is um, in light of globalization 
and um, uh, and, and and state-run economies. Uh, do uh, are the terms capitalism and and uh, socialism, communism? Are those terms uh, even relevant anymore? And then the second part of the question is: um, I've heard you say in the past that there are no more national economies. Yes. And in light of the and that Africa is not. Is not a, a, a civilization state. Um, then how does it solve its problems as with Pan Africanism if there are no national economies and decisions aren't made based on, you know? Oh yeah, that's an important question. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Firstly, what is international is not anti-national. It's not non-national. The national exists within the international. So an international economy is not uh, uh, what uh, Immanuel Kant said, above the nation humanity. It is within the nation's humanity. Of course, when he said humanity, he was probably referring to the Western world. It's not only humans. But um, I don't know. What was the first question? Uh, 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 About uh, the terms of communism, socialism, oh, yeah. capitalism. Yeah, and that's an interesting thing because I've been wrestling with that. I see the Russians who had been communists are calling their strategy social humanism hmm. as opposed I think they are speaking in Aesopian terms, though. As you know, socialism in the uh, the Marxist interpretation of socialism and communism is different from the popular interpretation. Socialism being a stage in the development toward communism. Communism being the most advanced. But, but they say we are a communist movement toward... Uh, even though we are not communists, where you have from each according to his ability and each according to his need. That only occurs when you at an advanced stage. Uh, uh, so what people are doing now as a result of the overthrow of the socialist system uh, is speaking in Aesopian terms. And I read a Russian journal, and I can tell from reading that, that uh, they are speaking in Aesopian terms. And some people in the ruling class know that too, because uh, they uh, that's why they have to make sure they don't get through this intermediate period. So, uh, now, so, so, now you know socialism, the way they use these terms as socioeconomic formations, capitalism, feudalism, slavery, as controversial questions, the ancient socioeconomic formation and socialism, communism. But uh, uh, so has the concept socioeconomic formation become useless? Now what you have, I don't agree with that, uh, even though they use in terms like modern, postmodern, which I think obscures the question, what does it mean to be postmodern? Uh, uh, what is the content of being postmodern? Uh, it's some subjective stuff. Well, what's going to happen 100 years from now? Is that going to be postmodern, post postmodern? I don't think the replacement, but we are at a stage in which people are, when I say speaking in Aesopian terms, is because the concept of socialism and communism has been delegitimized by not the failure, but the overthrow of the socialist system, a world system, in, led by the Soviet Union. And, uh, but the, you know, the Chinese still call themselves a socialist. They call themselves a socialist market economy. Now, if you know about the history of this, there's been plan and market under socialism. There has been controversies. Of course, when the Soviet Union was in existence, these terms were created by people in Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia, uh, respectively. That is, Branko Horvat, 
uh, was in, and I can never get it straight, one was in Czechoslovakia. And they talk about plan and market under socialism. But that gets a uh, plan and market under capitalism. A uh, plan and market, uh, uh, I forgot which one, Otisic, which, which one is Czech, I forgot. Um, but anyhow, uh, and there's a big controversy in the socialist dialogue as to whether the plan is indicative or, or directive. Now, the difference between the two is the plan is indicative. You make decisions in terms of what the market tells you to do. That I will mention in regard to China, uh, because the market will tell you, if you are interested in price formation, that your economy is overheated and you have to cut back production. But if the plan is directive, you will go further in economic development, even if prices fall. Now, now this is starting to happen, not just in in uh, in Russia and China, but in Japan, which has gone through a deflationary process for 20 years. Now, the logic of this stage of history is that there should be a deflationary process in the Western capitalist economy, which was overcome by this massive fictitious accumulation as a result of derivatives and so forth. And people don't see that properly. It is not just because of the greed of people in these uh, private equity funds, sovereign wealth funds, and so forth. It is a necessity to maintain the rate of profit by fictitious accumulation. That's the term that Steinbrook, the uh, uh, finance minister of the Social Democratic Party. Yeah. So what, what, what we hear having is moving into an intermediate period in which the forms of transitions were not anticipated by anybody, nor was it anticipated by socialist thinkers what would be the nature of the socioeconomic formation at this advanced so-called post-industrial society. I don't know whether I answered it, but anyhow. Your next question on, what was the next question was on? Uh, well, you, you had talked about uh, Africa uh, using uh, using Pan-Africanism yes. to solve their problems in light of the fact that there are no national economies and that, uh, uh, that Africa is not a... Uh, well, when I say there's no national economies, it does not mean that there is a world economy separate from national economies. I meant by that, that, and the same in the United States. As big as the United States is, uh, there is no solution, there is no nationalistic solution to this world e crisis. It has to be solved in relation to other nations. That does not mean, and I'm not recommending that nations cease to exist, but the nations should exist within the international. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, as they said, there was two tendencies under capitalism, the tendency to create a national economy and the tendency to create an international economy. The first tendency was most pronounced in the early period, national economies, and the second tendency is the dominant tendency in the world economy. Uh, the international elements of the economy is growing more rapidly than the national economies. And uh, what happens is, and some people know it, that's why we have a pamphlet put out by NATO uh, called Political Economy and National Security neoclassical realism. Now, when I read that pamphlet, I said, what are they talking about? One thing they're talking about is national security is related to what type of political economy. So when we talk about preserving our national security, it's, the, it's, it's not preserving our national security against attack 
militarily by a foreign power, but our national security requires that the world economy will be in conformity with neoclassical realism, which neoclassical is the is the conservative form, the extreme form of neoclassical is of course uh, neoliberalism, but it's not coterminous with that. But number two, what is realism? Now they probably got it from Kissinger and all those guys who are, which it comes out, they used to call it realpolitik, uh, which was the philosophy of Trotsky and others at the turn of the 19th century uh, to justify German imperialism. Now, uh, re- but we speak in uh, Aesopian ways, or maybe with fork tongues, which is uh, might be better, but realism is people saying that you are not following a realistic uh, policy in your country if you do not accept the fact that you are not conforming with neoclassical norms, which means we have a right to intervene in your country and overthrow it if necessary. But go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether I answered your question. Well, next question. Uh, yes, yes, I have a question. Um, good evening. This, my name is Chioma, and I have a couple of questions. I really appreciate this discussion, um, and I'm glad you just touched on neoliberalism, and, and I think you're distinguishing it from neoclassical realism, and I would like you to say more, but before that, um, the aspect of that that I'm curious in terms of your definition of internationalism is where privatization falls into this, which is what I perceive as eroding any national um, development, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere, right? And the other two questions, parts to my question are, you mentioned that they were steps that Nkuma skipped, and I just would like you to say more about those steps. And... Um, and then the other question is, what are your thoughts on the new development bank that Nigeria just established, which, you know, is supposedly um, to speak to the needs of internal development, even as it's getting, you know, high fives from the World Bank and, you know, African Development Bank. So just if you have any thoughts on that, if that's a positive step. And I guess there's a last question. I know that this discussion was... Um, essential around what the role of the diaspora is, and um, I would like for you to say more clearly what that what what is that role that you're defining in terms yes, of the yes, 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 yes. Thank you. That's a lot of questions. No, no. Let's deal with. What was the first question? I to do the whole question. I want to make sure. Huh? Privatization. Privatization. Yeah, that's an interesting question because privatization is the comes from the uh, uh, the necessity and and uh, is an, is a hell of a scene because there's also prayers in, in the crisis in Western Europe. Uh, before this crisis, Western Europe had 46 percent of the GDP in the public sector. And uh, some more than that. I think France for 56 percent, so forth. So what happens is that we have a crisis in the public sector, which is not indicative of a problem of socialism, but a problem of social democracy. And that's a whole nother question. Uh, but the uh, privatization was built into the Maastricht Treaty. Which was uh, which set up the eurozone, uh, which is built in repudiation of Keynesian methods, of Keynesian methods of using the public sector to rescue the private sector. Now, maybe I hate to quote him, but Soros in 2007 had an article and said we have traversed 60 years of history. And that's when we had the first recession in 47, 48. And that's a profound question. Has the public sector under capitalism ceased to be a way to solve the problems of the private sector? Uh, is And that's what you see is people talk about Keynesian methods are obsolete. 
I have mixed emotion on that. But in terms, that's why you see social democrats who believe in social reforms, but provided that they don't hurt capitalism, while the social democrats, whether they be Papademus in, uh, let's see, was he in Spain or, no, he was in, what you call it, Zach Patero uh, and Holland, who also support austerity programs. I think there's a crisis, a deep-seated crisis in the use of the public sector uh, to rescue the private, and it's expressed in the sovereign debt crisis, <laughs> namely that the public sector is in debt. Now, if you're in debt and you can't service your debt, you're supposed to give the property, whether it be uh, 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 your port facilities, or maybe the Greeks will try to see what they can get for the Parthenon, you know. But you have to, in conformity with their rules, and this is a crisis uh, that is very, very deep. And does that mean that the public sector can no longer rescue the private sector? No. It means that the public sector cannot rescue the private sector without transitional forms to a socialist economy. And that's where the fight is. That's why you see. Now, our, our form is not never reached that stage in which over half the GDP was in the public sector. That never happened in the United States. That's why the nature of this economic crisis in the United States is different than what it is in Europe. But I, I, and what's the next question? Yeah. Um, the other question, um, one of the other questions is, um, you mentioned that Nkrumah had steps that he missed and what those steps are that. Yeah. What are well, steps? Nkrumah had the notion of an African nation, you know, and that, that's a, a, a glorious notion, but, but if you study pan movements, you can't jump to an African nation if you don't have the material and technical base for it. And it's, it's idealistic, and we had the same with the Pan-American movement, the Pan-Asian movement, uh, but uh, as was in in the middle, in, with the Arabs, they are not Arabs first, and Egyptian second. So, such, such, uh, such, you have, to, they tried to do that in Western Europe with the concept of a Catholic nation to jump over stages. But the, that's the problem. It's very idealistic, but, but you can, but the rank and file person in the country does not consider himself an African first and a Nigerian sometime or Igbo second. That is not his primary ethnicity. Now the difference in the diaspora is that we were treated, our ethnoformative process or ethnogenesis is that if you're from Africa, you're all part of the same ethnic group. But the experience of the United States is not, uh, what shall we say, the concrete universal, the norm, but the exception, sui generis is a fancy word. Dobzhansky said that is the United States is the only place to see ethnicity in terms of white-black differences. So the effort to organize a nation on the basis that we're all black was unrealistic because that's not the primary consciousness of an, an African. He is not an African first, and he, he not so, sometime I wonder whether the Nigerian second. Do we have the same thing in the... So what you see in all pan movements, they fall apart in their original form when they leave the anti-colonial stage. What we had in common in Africa is that we've all been colonized by the Europeans. But if the Europeans move out, what do we have in common after that? And it's almost 
the same thing with the Pan Arab movement and the Pan American movement. And Simon Bolivar is very instructive on that. Uh, uh, the Bolivarian, when he predicted in 1826 uh, that uh, the United States is going to project America, because in 1826 we were not called America. Uh, uh, that comes with manifest destiny. In a morass of poverty in the name of liberty, because he recognized that. And what they did was uh, move toward a Creole aristocracy to develop a class of individuals who might be united by the obvious struggle against colonialism, but are not united on anything else. What's the next question? I don't know what the answer is, right? Yeah, but, uh, yeah um, <laughs> a lot, a lot. Um, but uh, the next question was uh, your thoughts on the Nigerian Development Bank, and maybe also tie that into then the role of the diaspora in defining what that role is. Yes. Well, you have to develop your national banks. Now, don't think that I or anybody else, when I said there's no national economies, that is tricky because the national still exists within the international. But the Nigerians need to develop uh, what is the terms of reference of this national bank. Because Nigerians have some problems in terms of how they have used their all wealth. Uh, they have been kind of kleptocratic, to put it mildly, is that a lot of the elites use the money engendered by the all to for personal aggrandizement rather than all sided development of the economy. But if the Nigerian National Bank is going to uh, lead to the all sided see I don't want to imply that the internationalization of production does not mean that you don't have to take on national tasks, but you have to take on national tasks within the framework of international. The classic case of that is, of course, the United States of America, who was a debtor nation up to World War I, and how did they develop? Because they use their predominantly given raw materials and so forth to Europe, predominantly England, in exchange for capital investment in their country. And they had conflicts over that because, you know, the National Bank went out as a result of some reactionary forces. We, I, we had the first National Bank, then some reactionary forces destroyed the bank, and it didn't come back into existence until the Civil War in the 1830s. But anyhow... So I'm not so what is going to be the policy of this national bank? Now the construction of it is a good thing. And the question is what type of policy are they gonna pursue? Which is the main thing, yeah. I don't are know. There any, are there any more questions? Um, can, can you please say more about defining this role of the diaspora in the global economy? Yeah, that's right. Now, the whole concept, that's a tricky question, diasporic studies. Because diasporic studies, and you have it in Great Britain, too, the major thrust, I think, of diasporic studies is the relationship between Africa and people in diaspora, especially... Americans. Now that, that gets very tricky because are the Americans in diasporic studies, and it was implicit in the 19th century, are we going to be a vice gerent for the penetration of U.S. into the African economy? And how does this compare? with the growing South-South dialogue in which the Africans probably, some Africans would have more relationships with South America than they have with the United States. Already, this thing is changing. So the diasporic studies is based upon 
an effort to bring back the form of Pan-Africanism that existed, I think, in the 19th century, which Pan-Africanism uh, would implicit this whole three C's, as we used to call it, civilization, commerce, and Christianity. Uh, these were the positions of, uh, what's his name, uh, Paul Cuffey, who emphasized the commerce more, Martin Delaney, the civilizational aspect, and uh, Garnett, being a bishop, the uh, Christian, Christianizing Africa. And that has some problems, because uh, Africa, as you know, is split between Christians and Muslims, so now they're going to deal with that question and also animists. There's some people who are neither Christian or Muslim. So the so the diasporic position is based upon, the, and it should be continued, but the content of what people in diasporic studies want as their socioeconomic position. Is their socioeconomic position to facilitate the establishment of capitalist relations between Africans and black Americans? Well, that gets very tricky as to what form of that. So even in the diasporic studies, I want to know the political position or the socioeconomic position of the people who envisage these linkages. Are there uh, any, any any more questions? Well, well Bob, uh, there is a, a new thrust towards um, reparations, yes. uh, which uh, is led um, at least ideologically by, uh, I think it's Sir Henry Beckles, mm -hmm. uh, uh, out of Barbados, who's, uh, whose book Britain's, uh, Great Britain's Black Debt, Yes, be a, a major piece of that. How do you see uh, this struggle for reparations yes. uh, as fitting into an overall uh, Pan-African thrust in the 21st century? Yes. First place, the concept of reparation was posited in the international resolution because it's not confined to the United States. By uh, who's his name? Bomedian of Algeria in 1971 as a part of the UNCTAD struggle, a United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. And the reparation was voted by the UN, uh, which we, General Assembly, as they voted into office, uh, was in the American Journal of International Law, if you want to f look it up, I don't know the exact date, uh, the obligations of states who practice colonialism. So I forgot, I, I didn't verbalize it right. Uh, uh, so reparation is a part of international law. Now, of course, the American Journal of International Law, being the American Journal, thought, attacked their whole notion of reparations. Now, reparations will have to be done properly through a program of development. Now, like the reparation between the Philippines and Japan resulted in the way they were conducted led to the Japanese corporations gaining the ascendancy in Filipino industry. So how you do, you had to do reparations in relationship to a program of development, otherwise you're giving money to opportunistic people among the oppressed people as a one-shot deal rather than as a development strategy. Now, now, the same in the United States. Do you have a development strategy connected with reparations? Because if you give money uh, and it's not connected with uh, social development, it just will lead to an inflation of prices in your country. And the one, uh, so that's a, a sophisticated question, but the question is the legitimacy of practicing 
what shall we say, an inequality in reverse to make up for the actual inequality that exists in the world. And the paradox is that it will be beneficial to the country even though it will not be beneficial to some vested interest in the country. So the certain vested interests interests are not synonymous with the national interests. But uh, uh, as you know, uh, I, I don't know about that book, but Enne Corey's wrote in a book on the, he's also written on the African slave trade, uh, on the role of Africa in the Industrial Revolution in England. In fact, you know that we actually finance the accumulation of capital in this country, uh, which was done by predominantly when the U.S. was getting formulated, which was done by over half of the goods and service shipped in international conduct conference was the product of slave labor. So we did help finance the early development of this speaking, country. Speaking of, of, of slave labor, uh, mm -hmm. last week the U.N. unveiled a permanent memorial to the victims of the transatlantic slave trade. Do you think this gives a signal to those people who are pushing reparations that the international community, at least the U.N., recognizes that as a legitimate struggle? Yes, they do recognize it as a legitimate struggle. And that is coming out of General Assembly. See, what happens, you got to distinguish of the different organs of the United Nations. That's a whole other question. Because the, the primary article of the United Nations was the General Assembly, because they did not anticipate the Cold War. The Security Council was supposed to be concerned predominantly with question of international peace and security. But uh, as a result of this, so the General Assembly, the General Assembly approved the concept of reparation back in 1971, the U.N. Conference on Trade and Development's resolution, and also this, I forgot the complete title of this, the obligation of states to give reparation to ex-colonial currency. Now the question is, people say, well you were not a colonial country, you were a population within the United States. Uh, and that gets to be a tricky question. Does international law apply to minorities who are oppressed within their own countries? So that's a legal question. I know that in Europe, they have what they call minority rights treaties, or the, the rights of minorities. And that's why a lot of people want to posit the notion that we are a nation, because they think the right to self-determination is only in relationship to nations. But that's not true. Uh, the right to self-determination did not start out as it was related to democratic struggles. In Europe, in fact, uh, uh, the struggle to get old regime. But uh, I don't know the answer. Uh, I haven't read the book, the last the book you mentioned, but I... But I know that uh, that uh, reparation is a part of international law. But we have a contempt for international law now. Increasingly, we don't accept the legi yeah, not me, but uh, the U.S. government, because of the changing representation in the U.N. Uh, the United States, and that's why they don't report to you on votes in the U.N., because most of them are not in conformity with what U.S. envisage as proper foreign policy. Well, there was very little mention of, of this uh, move on the part of, uh, of uh, the U.N. to unveil a permanent monument. Uh, yes, sir. I, I, I saw it in the foreign press. Yes, sir. Right. There's very little of the mention that Barbados and Jamaica uh, want to drop the Queen as the head of their nation. That's right. That's another question. The Commonwealth uh, is very interesting. Uh, how, yeah, the Commonwealth, uh, in early history, the Commonwealth, it's very interesting because it was a form of neocolonialism. So some people contend that 
Commonwealth of Independent States is similar in Russia uh, in terms of the states that used to be a part of the Soviet Union. Yeah. But I, I, but there's a difference. I, yeah, I see you. I see you. Uh, I think we're wearing you out a little bit. You seem to be losing uh, the energy in your voice. Are there any more questions? Um, this is uh, Jeffrey. Um, Dr. Rose, I had a question in just in relationship to you mentioned the um, whole focus on um, reparations. So, what might be you might say maybe two or three. You, you, key focuses of organizations, this is black organizations in this country, that they should be focused on in terms of addressing this issue of this international struggle. What are some of the key focuses that you think would be important to change the dynamic that broadened and expanded? And then, and specifically between people here and people in Africa, given that we have a larger population of people from Africa who are here, and that whole growing dynamic in terms of um, right. um, developing points of unity. Yeah, well, we, that's an interesting question because we have to watch the fact that I think there's going to be a new ethnic system coming in existence, uh, which will not base, be based on the binary system of ethnicity, where you're either black or white. But that's another question. Uh, one thing we have not had, and maybe you youngsters had to do that, because I think a lot of my old friends are trying to resuscitate uh, the movement of the 60s. And that period of history has been traversed. In fact, Martin and Malcolm was mo- Malcolm in relationship to the Muslims, and Martin in relationship to the civil rights movement was trying to move to another stage of the struggle. And that's probably why they were assassinated. Uh, but we have not had, it's happened before in history, we have had not had recently something like the National Negro Congress or or the, the uh, movement at the turn of the century, which essentially, you know, the Niagara movement was a move away from the leaders in the 19th century who had got stuck at a stage of history. That's including Frederick Douglass, as quiet as it kept. Uh, he did not understand the post-Civil War period. Uh, but he's a great man. But anyhow, so we have not had... We tried to do something in the 80s. We were attacked by the Erie Movement because we met along Lake Erie in uh, in Cleveland. The white left calls it the Erie Movement. They spell it E-E-R-I-E. <laughs> that, that, uh, but there was a moment left. Uh, we are not in as strategic a position as we were 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, they, and this is very dangerous because the role of Afro-Americans in this economy in the mainstream of American society is being marginalized. This uniform post-city for now. So we have to, we need a national democratic movement of a new type that expresses, and you've got to have a general framework for your struggles. Well, your struggles will be battles, but they will not be strategic. The result of that, you'll be hitting the opposition on his left toenail and his right kneecap where he's steadily jabbing you in the mouth. And you can land more blows than him and still lose. But this is a very... So there is a need for... But anyhow, we're, just, we're going to wrap it up here. Is there any well, other I don't know whether I answer his question or not. But it's, it's how we are in a hell of a scene. I don't think people realize the enormity of what's happening with the Afro-American community in this country that is on a descending line of development. And it's mm-hmm. not just this country. Mm-hmm. And that's why you see throughout the developed world secessionist movement in Catalonia and in Spain and 
Scotland and ethnic resurgence, which take a racial form in this country. And, uh, but, uh, mm. hello, hello? Yeah, this is a difficult question, what you ask. Because I'm, uh, we are in less strategic position in this country. We have been strategic in this country in the past, in the U.S. economy. But some of us, and it's not just us, are not strategic in the economy anymore. And this uniform post-city phenomenon, you see it in Washington, D.C., is the pushing of blacks to the suburbs, black suburbanization. And we call it inner city suburbs because that's not where the action is going to be. And I, I think other people have been, see, we're at a stage in history where sizable proportions of the world population is no longer a part of the future in this system. And the people in power know it. And they call it the general lumpen tree system. We call it the underclass. It's not peculiar to the United States. But blacks are part of it. It won't be all of us, but a sizable portion of our population. What kind of strategy can we pursue? One thing, we got to have relations with our unreliable white allies. But that's a very tricky question. If you know the history of the movement, I think uh, what you call a Bennett in his book on Lincoln sums it up. He called it the Garrison fault. William Lloyd Garrison is the fault that at a certain stage, your white allies will drop their relationship with you because you're supposed to be a catalytic agent for their movement. But as I said, there's two type of catalytic agents. Both of them speed up the process, but one speed up the process in the part of a new formation, and other speeds up the process and used up in the process. But, uh, but so how do we avoid being used up in the process of struggle, which costs, and this has existed throughout our history, Frederick Douglass experienced this in his relationship with Garrison. Uh, T. Thomas Fortin. You should read T. Thomas Fortin. He's of Malcolm X of the 1880s. And uh, yeah, for some reason, he's not in our uh, heroes. But he, he posited the notion race first and party second because he thought that the Republican Party was no longer the ally of the black community. My, my, when the, most of the people in the movement, anti-slavery movement, had become members of the Republican Party. But anyhow, so uh, a young, you young people are, got a fight on your hand, and uh, you know, it's going to be delicate because you're going to have to lodge a community, and they are... What shall we say to quote Robert Allen? Uh, they are reluctant reformers. Are you still uh, there? Yes, we're all here. But I maybe they will change. If you know the history of the United States, and I say this reluctantly because it might make you pessimistic, but the history you're in a right wing democracy. And if you know the history of the United States, uh demography might help us, uh but White Americans, especially white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Americans, have never been consistent liberals, and liberalism has a problem now, uh, in the history of this country. They would jump on the bandwagon in an emergency, but they drop it as soon as the emergency is over. Mm -hmm. I cite that because they even have the Roosevelt. But you know, in 1938, after that overwhelming victory in uh, 1936, that the Americans voted for the Republican Party to take over Congress, we had the same thing during the Civil War. In the midst of the Civil War, in 
uh, the Democratic Party won the congressional election when Lincoln was in, <coughs> and nobody in the South was voting. They won the election with the majority of Democrats in the North voting uh, uh, whites in the North. There's a romantic history of the United States. That's why you ought to read Gerald Horn's book, which is very revelatory. His history on this counter-revolution, 1776, these books on blacks and browns, which is on blacks in the Mexican struggle. And his book, of course, on Du Bois, which deals with the late Du Bois uh, from the 1930s to he died in 1963. But I said this with reluctance because I've been able to stay in the struggle because it's been ideologically grounded. But uh, uh, you have uh, the metastasis of despair in our movement which is what Ullman in his biography of Martin Delaney. Do you know every black nationalist in the 19th century started out in the civil rights movement and experienced certain frustration and they metastasized into nationalists. That's up to including Stokely Carmichael who eventually became Kwame Ture. But he started out in the student nonviolent coordinate committee. That's so this right. is a pattern. But uh, but we have to be open. And I don't know the answer to this question. What is the form? Because my experience is if you understand this, your white radicals don't want anything to do with you. <laughs> uh, I have never been a votary of white. I work with white radicals. But I have never been one of their followers. But you had to be practice new forms of social mimicry. But they are but it's a hell of a thing. Because it's not peculiar to the United States as to how radicals in developed countries deal with oppressed national minorities. Whether it's the British with the with the Irish and Obama has talked about that even in Russia. The Russians with the non Russians under under the communists uh, creating the sobriquet revolutionary uncle If you are critic if you are a careerist and to be a careerist you have to become a follower of your white mentors. No. And if you make a break with it, like T. Thomas Fortune did, like I think Martin was trying to do, Martin Luther King, Malcolm was never predominantly in white organizations. Mm -hmm. But it's a recurring problem if you read the history, the biography of all these black leaders, A. Philip Randolph and so forth. How do you stay on the path? It's a very interesting question. All right. We said we were going to uh, stop at, at 8. It's pretty close to 8. Thank well, you. Well, thank you, uh, Robin Rhodes. Uh, thank all of you. And um, we will continue this discussion in the very near future. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you, man. Thank you all. All right. All right, everybody, have a good evening. Bye. Thank you, you too. All right. Thank you, Professor Rhodes.